The Outer Limits television series was released on September 16, 1963. Along with Star Trek and The Twilight Zone, it comprised what's called the Holy Trinity of 1960s television sci-fi, but it's definitely the most overlooked one of the three, which is kind of strange considering its unbelievable pedigree, having some of the most talented people in the business working on it. The show had some of the best cinematographers, special effects people, fantasy writers, and actors of the day. The Outer Limits is an anthology of self-contained episodes. Sometimes there's a really strange plot twist at the end. The series is often confused with The Twilight Zone, but there are a few differences between them. On one hand, The Outer Limits episodes were all one hour long, versus half an hour for The Twilight Zone. Also, some of The Twilight Zone episodes dealt with some whimsical and sometimes funny topics, but The Outer Limits basically stuck to unsettling monsters and hard science fiction. The original working title of the TV series was Please Stand By. They scrapped that name when the network became concerned that audiences might mistake the opening credits as an emergency broadcast interruption of service, especially when you consider the images of the test patterns in the intro. You've got to realize that this was during the Cold War, and Americans were already on edge. Some of the episodes were filmed at really interesting homes that exist. There's a house that's in the hills above Los Angeles that looks like a UFO. It literally looks like a flying saucer on stilts, and it turns up in a dozen Hollywood productions. But The Outer Limits was the first screen production to feature this architectural marvel, which was built in 1960. The house was used on an episode called The Duplicate Man. There were also episodes that were filmed at the homes of the producers, most notably Joseph Stefano. The introduction to each show would begin with either a cold open or a preview clip that would be followed by a voice control narration running over the visuals of an oscilloscope. It gave an Orwellian feel to them taking over your television set, and the earliest versions of this intro read like this. There is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. If we wish to make it louder, we will bring up the volume. If we wish to make it softer, we will tune it to a whisper. We will control the horizontal. We will control the vertical. We can roll the image. We can make it flutter. We can change the focus to a soft blur or sharpen it to a crystal clarity. For the next hour, sit quietly. We will control all that you see and hear. We repeat, there is nothing wrong with your television set. You are about to participate in a great adventure. You are about to experience the awe and mystery, which reaches from the inner mind to the outer limits. Some of the greatest writers in Hollywood pin the scripts to the show. A great television show begins with great writers, and The Outer Limits had a legendary group of writers. People like Robert Town, who won the Oscar for the Chinatown script, wrote the episode of The Chameleon. And then there's Harlan Ellison, who wrote a couple of brilliant scripts for the series. And then there was the series producer Joseph Stefano, who wrote more episodes than anyone else. He had just come off writing the Psycho screenplay for Alfred Hitchcock. The Outer Limits also utilized one of Hollywood's greatest cinematographers. Conrad Hall is considered one of the best in history. He did things like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, all the way up to American Beauty, and you'll see his expertise in 15 episodes of The Outer Limits. One of them is an episode called The Architects of Fear, which is one of the most famous episodes on The Outer Limits. There are a lot of the monsters that were used on The Outer Limits that were later recycled and used on Star Trek. After The Outer Limits ended in 1965, many of the cast and crew went on to work on Star Trek and this actually included some of the monsters, too. The massive micro-beast, seen in the final episode, called The Probe, went on to become the Horta in the Devil in the Dark episode of Star Trek. William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy appeared on The Outer Limits, too. Before they became Spock and Kirk, these two icons worked on separate episodes. One of them was iRobots, 
and the other was Cold Hand's warm heart. There's just a web of connections between the actors, the writers, and even the special effects made monsters in all the sci-fi shows of the early 60s. The movie The Terminator was actually sued for plagiarism for the episode of The Soldier in the Outer Limits. See if this plot sounds familiar to you. A soldier from the future, a future where men are machines, born to kill, is sent through time, arriving on a city street in an electrical storm. He is followed by his enemy, another killer from the future. Harlan Ellison wrote the episode The Soldier, which was a season two premiere. Two decades later, when he saw The Terminator, Ellison would go on to file a lawsuit against the film studio Orion Pictures. Director James Cameron conceded that he was influenced by the episode, so Ellison was awarded money and credit on the movie. We talked earlier about an episode called The Architects of Fear. This was a unique episode as far as the series goes. It featured a really gruesome beast, who is actually the distorted form of Alan Layton, played by Robert Culp. When you look at this monster today, it almost looks silly, but you have to go back to the context of the early 60s, and it probably was scary at the time. Some of the ABC affiliates found the creature so disturbing that they opted to insert a black blank screen instead of showing the creature. In other markets, the footage was held back until after the 11 o'clock news, so that the kids would be in bed. This show was a super big hit for young audiences in its first season. However, ABC decided to move the series to Saturday evenings as a lead-in to the Lawrence Welk show. This was a crazy generation gap. Plus, it was opposite Jackie Gleason and his American Scene family, which ruined Outer Limits in the ratings. So the show was then canceled midway through season two. Many years later, the series The Outer Limits may still send a chill up your spine and dazzle you with its craft. It may be time to take another look at this classic 60s show. If you enjoyed this video, check out the description for links that help support the channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching.